Cool. So I'll be speaking on open source infrastructure. This is a lightning talk, so you uh, best be prepared for me to be off in about five minutes. A um, little bit about me. I'm a systems engineer at ctgeek.com. We're a ticketing platform based in New York. Uh, I've been a core developer for about five years, uh, and you can find me on uh, Twitter as Savant and GitHub as Jose Gonzalez. I'm also not Jose Lorenzo, and nor am I Jorge Gonzalez, and I think there's another Jose running around here who I also am not. Cool. So a couple statistics about the KPHP organization. There's about 25 different core developers on the team. Uh, at any point in time, there's about 15 to 20 who are actively uh, uh, working on Cake PHP initiatives, that sort of thing. About five different continents. I don't really know if anyone's in Antarctica, but I'd be not shocked. Uh, there's 15 different time zones, 15 plus, at least that I counted, uh, where we have someone who's stationed, and we're speaking around 12 to 15 different languages uh, across the organization. So who makes up uh, Cake PHP and what do we do? Um, that's not it. Uh, we write, translate, write and translate documentation, right? So there's obviously the docs website, but we also have the API docs, we also have the bakery, that sort of stuff. Uh, and that needs to be translated and not to just German or French, but uh, languages like Japanese uh, and Portuguese, that sort of thing. We maintain the existing Cake PHP websites, so whether that be uh, continuing to improve uh, accessibility on the bakery or adding search to the uh, docs website, that's stuff that we work on. We work on new core initiatives, uh, whether that be stuff like working on the framework itself, so building out some functionality or implementing some PSR, that sort of thing, or working on stuff that we can uh, do to improve our, um, our community, so reaching out to user groups in other countries, that sort of thing. Provide support via chat, email, forums, uh, really anything and everything that we, or every, any place that we can, that's where we provide support. Some of us provide support on Twitter, some of us don't. Um, and then finally, we wrangle social media, so responding to people on Facebook or whatever other social media platforms that we have a presence on. What sort of day jobs do we have? We actually have a car parts salesman, and that was the one thing that shocked me really, really hard when I first started. It was kind of crazy. I was like, wow, this guy's writing code. Um, we have a couple of people who own their own companies. Uh, Larry is one of them, but there are other people who are on the core team and have other responsibilities outside of development. We have at least one professional dancer, I think two. The one professional dancer you might have met, uh, seen him walk out of uh, the speaker dinner if you were there last night. Um, he has a couple of different engagements going on, I guess. Uh, and then of course we have software developers. I myself uh, would consider myself that, and the majority of the people on the core team are software developers. So. If we look at like everyone's backgrounds and we try to think, all right, fine, well, what do they do? How do they uh, help the organization succeed? One of the things that we have to deal with is server time or server uptime, right? But everyone here is a volunteer, so we have to think about uh, other things, right? Outside of whether or not our docs website is up, right? We have a life outside of uh, Cake PHP. We have jobs. We have work. We don't want to uh, really investigate whether or not the server got hacked. That's going to be a bad time, regardless of whether or not it's paid or uh, open source work. It's not really something that I want to look at. Uh, we don't want to figure out if the server is down or why is the server down or investigate any of that sort of stuff. It kind of takes a little bit of time. We don't really have that time. And we also don't want to figure out who can actually deploy these websites, right? Uh, as soon as we make these changes uh, and we want to push them live for our users, we don't want to have to go through 10 different convoluted steps that might not be documented in order to get that one CSS fix out there, right? So what problem do we actually have? We have to make sure that our websites and services are available to all of our users, regardless of where they are located and regardless of the, what their connection is, et cetera. Um, and we have to do that with uh, minimal work on our end, right? I don't really want to spend my entire afternoon working on the Cake PHP server. I don't think Mark does either. Neither does anyone else, really. Um, so we want to make sure that we minimize the amount of time that we spent on the server infrastructure in order to provide the services that we do provide. So what does this all mean? We have to provide all of this stuff, right? So centralized logging, making sure that we can go to one place and find all of the logs for the servers, right? If something's blowing up, we want to make sure that we don't have to dig around five different places in order to find, oh, MySQL's dying sort of thing. We have to have server metrics and uh, application performance monitoring, right? We want to make sure that the server's healthy, that it has this space available. We want to make sure that the applications aren't acting screwy, that sort of thing. So that's uh, something that we have to provide. We have to make sure that all of the access to these servers is actually well controlled, right? I while I w it would be nice to have everyone ha having access to the servers because we're an open source organization, I don't think it's really necessary for every one of our users to have SSH access and root on the box. Um, we have to provide backups and backup testing, right? Just because you have backup doesn't mean it actually works, and just because you test it doesn't mean it's actually going to help you when you most need it. 
Uh, and we also have to scale, right? We're going to have users, and we're going to have bumps of users every once in a while. And this happens for a lot of organizations when they say, all right, fine, we're on the news. We suddenly have two or three X the users, right? In our case, we can sort of figure out ahead of time how many users we're going to have because we're fairly static. But at the same time, we have to make sure that our fairly static load or our fairly static setup can survive you know, a bump of two or three X uh, the traffic while we're scaling up. And then finally, of course, disaster recovery. What happens if everything goes kaput? How do we restore all of that stuff? How do we make sure that like, we're back online in as minimal amount of time as possible? Cool. So all of these things are actually full-time jobs that you can have at a normal paid institution. And again, we are a volunteer organization, so we probably aren't going to do this for our full-time volunteer work. And there are, t there are jobs for teams of de uh, dedicated systems engineers. It's not just one person at an organization that is working on uh, centralized logging or authentication and access control. There are multiple people who are working on these problems. Um, but this is fine, right? We have a couple people on the organization who can sort of like deal with this sort of stuff. Um, it's not really that big of a problem. Like I said, we have 25 people. They're available in multiple time zones. Why is this even a problem, right? At any point in time, there might be five to 10 people awake, right? So if you're looking at 3 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, right? There's gonna be a couple people in Europe. I might be awake. There might be some people in Asia, but they probably don't all work on the same stuff, right? So we're limited on that end. They might be working on paid work or side project. They have a life, et cetera. Maybe they have kids and they're dealing with their kids. So while they might be online, they aren't necessarily available to work on things, right? Some of the people who are on the core team have a ton of info experience, right? I myself, that's my day job, so like I know how that stuff works. But some people don't have that experience, right? Maybe they're just starting with Cake PHP and they're working on the documentation website. So they don't have that experience that I might have and that knowledge uh, to work on top of. There's also a language barrier, right? Like I said, there's uh, at least 12 different languages that we speak. Some of our uh, core developers are, I would say, uh, less capable of speaking English or understanding. Um, and while we do try to work around that, it's still a problem for us right, as an organization. And then finally, we don't really have that much time to onboard people to what we do and how we do things, right? Again, everyone here is a volunteer. We can't really spend that much time saying, all right, fine, your first day, on the Cake PHP organization, here's your laptop, here's uh, keys to the castle, here's how everything works. We don't really have that much uh, leeway, right? That person has to just get up and running and working on whatever it is that they want to work on. So usually when you have problems like this, when you don't have uh, dedicated resources potentially or someone internally who can work on this sort of stuff, uh, you want to pay for a service, right? And why don't we pay for a service? Well, it'd be nice if KPC could uh, pony up the money, but they're not made out of money and they're a business. Um, there's much better things they can be spending their money on, such as uh, providing support for our community or raising awareness, that sort of thing. So it's not necessarily something I would rather them spend money on, right? Services are actually pretty expensive. If you're looking at something like Heroku, you can have a dyno that's up available 24-7 for $7. Great. We have, I think, 15 different services that we provide, and each one of them it would be another $7. We have to provide high availability, so that's $14. We have data stores that we have to provide, et cetera, right? So it's not cheap. Um, and then they still require maintenance and onboarding stuff, right? Just because you pay for a service doesn't mean everyone on your organization is going to understand how that service works, right? So all, all reasons why we don't actually pay for a service. Uh, the other thing is I mentioned there are a couple people who are on the core team who are systems engineers, myself included. So why can't they just deal with that stuff, right? They have full-time jobs, and they might be burnt out from working on server infrastructure, right? When I get home, I don't necessarily want to work on a server or, like, figure out what the uptime is of the Cake PHP website, right? That's not on my high priorities for uh, open source development. Um, they might be working on different kinds of tech, right? So just because you are a software developer doesn't mean you can go to another organization and write code for them, right? They might be writing Python code, whereas you're a PHP developer. In this case, they might be using Chef, and we use Ansible. Or they might be on Rackspace, and we're on AWS, right? So the technology might change a little bit. And they may not be available. Again, this goes back to the fact that we're all uh, volunteers. Uh, when I get out of work, maybe I'm on vacation, maybe I only have one or two hours a day to spend on Cake PHP, and those one or two hours a day don't actually coincide with when we are having uh, server issues, right? So of course, uh, we're going to bring technology into this and figure out how we can use technology to solve all of our problems, because technology always solves everything, right? So the first thing is when we are uh, picking technology and choosing what uh, will work for the organization, we want to choose technology that solves the problem, right? We don't want to choose technology that will just make other problems for us, right? While technology is cool and you can experiment with new things, that's great. We're a volunteer organization. We don't have time to experiment with stuff. It just has to work, right? You can leave your experimentation for, I don't know, when you're uh, 
without a job and you're on like funny money sort of stuff, right? But not for an open source organization that just has to provide these services, right? We have to pick uh, technology that is familiar to the maintainers, right? So I'm not going to pick something that potentially I am the only one who is aware of how that works or in theory how that stuff works, right? It'd be nice for me to pick uh, uh, Kubernetes or Mesos or any of those uh, auto-scaling platforms, but most of the people on the core team don't really understand how that works, and they're just getting to the hump of, we have a server, how is the server going to be available sort of thing, right? Let's see what else. Uh, it has to be quick to pick up, right? So even if the technology is familiar to people, if it's only going to be familiar to three people and then we have to teach another 15 people how it works and they're having troubles with it, that's probably the wrong technology. And I think that's something that you can bring back to your own organization and say, hey, why are we picking PHP if PHP is hard to pick up? Why are we picking X if X is hard to pick up? Not that PHP is hard, right? Uh, we should probably pick the boring choice because the boring choice is the best choice. Boring choice has already been proven. It's stable, probably. Uh, it is familiar to a lot of people in your organization or there's a lot of literature out there. If you pick something new, the new hotness is probably going to be broken in about five minutes. Uh, so that's why you want to pick something boring. If you want to experiment with something, great. But again, if you don't have that much time, probably shouldn't be doing that. Should be easy to extend your infrastructure, right? So uh, the, cha the needs of an organization are constantly evolving. In, the, in Cake PHP's case, we are constantly adding or removing services internally uh, and then figuring out new ways to eke a little bit more performance out of our websites. So it should be very easy for us to modify the system and the setup that we have in order to do that sort of uh, work. And then finally, we need to be able to sort of uh, um, codify the infrastructure that we have, right? Um, we need to have all of that code, all of those changes in a single repository somewhere. So I can say conf concretely, co uh, confidently, that this change was applied by this person at this point in time, and this was the reason why they applied that change, right? And if I can do that using a repository, using infrastructure as code, that's great, because then in the future, when something breaks, I can point to the fact that, no, that was a fix for this thing, right? So what did we pick as uh, code that we can use? Uh, for configuration management, we used Ansible. So if uh, people aren't familiar with configuration management, that's just a way of managing your server configuration, right? So making sure that the proper users are installed, making sure your proper software is there, that sort of thing, right? Why did we pick Ansible? Uh, everyone can read YAML. It's pretty easy to pick up. They have a little bit of syntax on top of it uh, using Jinja for templating, so you can use uh, loops and that sort of thing. Uh, Ansible has a really, really low learning curve, uh, and if you try to go out and pick up Ansible, there are quite a few uh, tutorials. It's uh, one of the, I think, fastest growing configuration management tools in the space. Um, maps really, really well to existing server tasks, right? So if you need to create a user, that's something that's already defined within Ansible. You don't have to uh, go ahead and recreate the wheel on that end, right? You don't have to say, all right, how do I install a package? They already have uh, primitives to for doing that. And then finally, it's also really, really easy for us to write custom modules, right? Uh, at the end of the day, the uh, configuration manage management tool that we use isn't necessarily going to integrate with every single piece of uh, technology that we use. So we need to be able to ensure that we can write any extra extensions to integrate with that. Why wouldn't we want to use Ansible? So everyone needs SSH access to the box uh, just because of how, or boxes, just because of how Ansible works. It compiles the uh, tasks locally and then SSH onto the box, runs a command. Right, so that might be something that maybe isn't uh, quite what you want for your organization. Right? Repo credentials are in the open, uh, even if they're encrypted. So if you need to, I don't know, uh, apply an SSL certificate to your website, that's something that's committed to the repo or s and somewhere else. Um, and even if it is encrypted, anyone who has that password, which in theory is everyone who has repo access, can decrypt that and potentially do some malicious damage. Um, YAML kind of sucks as an automation language. Uh, it's really nice to be able to write actual code for your infrastructure as opposed to this thing that's, uh, I don't know, janky. Uh, there's, there's really no like good uh, integration with IDEs, for instance, for linting and of your YAML stuff. So that's one of the things that like kind of sucks uh, just because like you can accidentally indent using a tab versus a space, not notice it, and then your entire YAML will fail. So that's an issue you have to deal with. Finally, like something that I've noticed is that the uh, community itself moves really, really quickly and tends to break very, very small things that you might not realize are important. Um, so, for instance, there was a bug uh, in production that I had where uh, Ansible wasn't properly paginating against resources and accidentally took down half of my infrastructure. And I was like, oh, that's not good. I need those servers. So that's something that you have to deal with and sort of like test out properly. Right? As far as like continuous, continuous integration is concerned, we use Jenkins. Continuous integration is like sort of a process where you make changes to your code 
and then you automatically apply some extra process. Usually that's like testing or linting or something like that, right? And potentially also uh, deploying your code afterwards via continuous deployment. Uh, why did we use Jenkins? Everyone hates Jenkins e uh, equally. Um, there's not really any reason for anyone to advocate for it, but everyone knows that it's like the, it's the thing that gets the job done, right? So we know how it breaks, we know why it sucks, it sort of works, it's fine. Um, the jobs can actually be generated via Groovy DSL, which is pretty useful because if the Jenkins box dies, then we can go back and apply that DSL and get our jobs back, no problem. Which is a serious issue if you're uh, using some other custom uh, CI tool that just sort of allows you to embed a script from somewhere and like store in a database. What happens if your database dies? Well, you no longer have your job. Um, it's deployable via Docker, which in a moment I'll explain why that's kind of important, but generally like uh, the easier or the quicker we can get the application running, in this case, Docker run Jenkins, uh, the more likely it is that we're going to have that actually deployed in production. And then finally, there's plugins for literally everything. If you want to notify Slack or send an email, there's a plugin for that. If you want to upload a package to uh, S3, there's a plugin for that. Right? So there's nothing really that you have to actually build. You just have to sort of deal with where you find that plugin. Why wouldn't we use Jenkins? Um, the ecosystem is constantly moving. So this is a problem I have at work where basically every day I refresh the uh, Jenkins UI and it's like, oh, 10 new uh, plugins have been updated and there's a new version of Jenkins. So you have to figure out whether or not it's worth applying those changes, whether you should wait, whether or not there are security issues in those plugins, right? So not so great for that. The default UI is kind of janky as well. Um, they have Blue Ocean, which works really well if you use uh, their pipeline system, uh, but not really well for uh, freestyle jobs. So that's something that you have to sort of deal with. Um, and then finally, it's really, really easy to use and abuse plugins. Again, because they're everywhere and they do everything, you can sort of have like freestyle jobs that aren't really uh, contained anywhere that like you don't really know what the logic is around them. And some of these plugins are kind of like uh, creaky. So really easy to like screw up your uh, non-pipeline jobs using that. Uh, why wouldn't we use an, a paid service, right? The paid services are actually pretty expensive for CI. They normally charge you per CI job, sort of, or CI build. So if you have, let's say, 15 websites and then uh, 17 different targets, you're paying for 17 different targets on their platform, right? I think uh, Travis CI has um, $500 for uh, 10 jobs at once. Um, and if we're constantly running jobs, that just means that like our deployments are late, that sort of thing. So it can be expensive. Um, jobs are usually attached to a single repository, and in our case, we usually have like one repository and multiple targets. A good example of that is the documentation website where we build the docs for every single version of CakePHP that we have released, right? 1.2, I think 1.1 as well, 1.3, 2.x, 3.x, and then 3.next, which is our next uh, 3.0 release. Um, and to do that out of like a single repository is pretty nice, but if we can't do that out of a single repository, it makes the workflow for contributing documentation changes a little bit more onerous on our users. Um, it's hard to do op, uh, open source uh, um, securely on some of these platforms because we can't really securely share these secrets. If someone forks your repository, suddenly they have your SSH key and they can SSH onto your box. Kind of not something that we want to promote. Um, and that goes back to, well, now we can pay for the service, but it's going to be expensive. And then finally, we're at the whim of the service providers, right? So if the service provider gets uh, acquired or they get shut down, then we have to deal with that. Wrecker actually just got acquired by Oracle, right? So if we were on Wrecker's platform, we'd have to reevaluate whether or not that's a platform that we want to use going forward, right? So those are a couple of reasons why we wouldn't want to use a uh, paid service for CI. As far as automated deployments are concerned, uh, we use a tool called Doku. Um, automated deployments, I think everyone here has probably deployed some code at some point, and if not, you probably will. Uh, really, really soon. But um, Doku is just a platform, a build platform for releasing code. Uh, why did we pick Doku? Um, it's already built. It's already there. Uh, it's free. Um, so we didn't really need to make anything custom for that. Uh, it integrates pretty well with Ansible. So Ansible, like I said before, you can write custom modules. So anything that like we needed to automate for Doku, we were pretty. it was pretty easy to write those modules to wrap that around and make it more Ansible-like. Um, it's designed with Docker in mind. So if uh, we want to deploy a. Is that all right? If we wanted to deploy an application uh, using the Heroku build packs, which is the default, that's great. But if we want to dig down further and do some customization around like what packages we installed, we can also do that. So as an example, the Docs website uses a lot of LaTeX, and that's kind of uh, annoying to install. So being able to have like full control over your like virtual server is pretty important there. And 
That was pretty useful. It has an internal champion. So by the way, I am one of the maintainers of Doku. So it's really easy for me to go back and say, hey, the Cake PHP organization has this need or this bug that they have to deal with. Let me make that easy for us to do just by default as opposed to writing a custom plugin. Uh, and then finally, it's OSS, right? So it's pretty easy for us to install on a new server. Um, pretty easy for us to sort of uh, train people internally just because they're familiar with oper oh, open source software and how that works. Why didn't we pick another solution? Um, so Doku is a single server solution for deployments. Um, you can use it in a clustered mode, but it's not really straightforward. Um, and at the time when we were first picking this technology, it uh, solved the need that we had. We just needed to deploy a couple uh, side uh, websites and side services, and they didn't really need to be clustered or anything like that. Um, we can withstand about 30 minutes of downtime during restores. Because it's a single server, if the server dies, we do have to rebuild all of those websites. It's not too big of a deal, uh, and we've had outages that are much larger than that, so I'm not too worried. Um, there's no real like setup or training costs around uh, Doku. It's really sim It's really simple. It's about uh, 3,000 lines of Bash. Sorry, um, but uh, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that we do is pretty automated. Um, whereas for some of the larger systems like uh, Kubernetes or Mesos, you sort of have to dig into the uh, documentation to figure out how they work, and they're really really complex systems, right? You ca actually would have to have a team of people to set that up and maintain it and uh, keep it happy. Um, if we were to dig down. Uh, away from some of these schedulers uh, and just do custom scripting to you know automatically install stuff that's great but now you have these custom scripts that are potentially out of date or not kept uh, with the repository so we don't know how this application got built we don't know that these are the dependencies for uh, generating the documentation in Farsi that sort of thing right um, and then finally we didn't need to rebuild any of this stuff right like again like I said this was already available to us uh, it was already there. I didn't need to actually sit down and write a build pipeline and then a deploy pipeline. Right? So some considerations uh, you should take into account when you're building out your infrastructure. Um, in our case, everyone has access to the uh, repository and everyone has access to the uh, servers themselves. Um, but that might not be something that you want right, for your organization. If you're like the NSA, for instance, you don't want to have the janitor have access to your server. But in our case, it's fine that the car part salesman has access to the server. He sort of knows what he's doing. Um, that might not be appropriate for your organization, so something to consider. Um, if you did have a smaller circle of people working on your infrastructure, that would be good just because then you can sort of say, all right, fine, only uh, Mark has the keys to the castle and only Lorenzo has keys to the castle. So I know that the changes were made by either of them or it's a bad change, right? Um, whereas it's a little bit harder to deal with when you're um, uh, expanding that scope of access. But it also means that like, if there are issues when Mark, Lorenzo, and myself aren't available, then there's no one to fix them and our outages increase. Right? So it's harder to deal with in a distributed context. Uh, one thing that we do is we uh, encrypt uh, passwords and keys. So you have to figure out how you want to encrypt them for sharing internally. You can use something like Blackbox, which is pretty generic. It uses GPG encryption. Um, but there are plenty of tools that do that. Um, the other issue we have to deal with is establishing an initial web of trust. So I kind of know who Mark Story is because I've met him in person. I know who some of these other people are because I've met him in person, but I still don't really know how uh, 80 Mad looks like, right? He's one of our developers in, I think, Bangladesh? I'm not really sure. Um, but no one's ever seen his face. So how do I know that I'm giving the right person access, right? How do I establish that initial web of trust? Um, we strong authentication. We, we prefer keys to passwords. Uh, if anyone is caught with a password on my server, I will delete their user and never grant them access ever again. Um, but that's something that you should sort of figure out. What level of uh, authentication or encryption or security do you want? Right? Because you can be really, really onerous, or you can be really, really lax. And then finally, like we don't audit SSH sessions. right? So in theory, anyone who is accessing the server can make a change, not apply that in our uh, Ansible setup and then move on. Or maybe they can make some malicious change and move on, and no one would be, would be much the wiser. Right? So that's something that you might want to implement for your infrastructure. As far as logging is concerned, when we want centralized logs, um, they should be aggregated. If you have a single server, you probably don't need it. But if you have multiple servers, rather than figuring out what, app, what server that application is living on or what box is having an issue, if you have one place where you can look, it's great. Um, I recommend something like Greylog. Greylog is really, really easy to pick up. It uh, has a fantastic web UI, uh, really, really easy to ship logs to it, and easy to sort of grok and parse logs out of there. Your logs should all probably be in the same format. So whether that's JSON or log format, doesn't really matter. As long as it's the same thing and someone can read a log from one application and go to the other one, and it's roughly the same. 
Um, and I'll show you an example of log format in a bit. And you probably shouldn't make up your own date time uh, format. Uh, I've seen people just like remove the time zone or remove the seconds or remove minutes or not have time at all in their log format. You just use ISO 8601 and you'll be fine. So here's an example of a log line, right? So I have a uh, log level, I have the date time, and then I have a message, right? Pretty simple, pretty trivial uh, log message. Most uh, uh, loggers have some format or something similar where they can do this. Um, generally speaking, we want to make our logs more useful by adding metadata. So what actually spit out that log, um, whether or not that's a metric that we can actually pull out, so some sort of tag, uh, what uh, module actually wrote that log, right? Because you can have something that's processing a worker, but that's not the same thing as the module that actually uh, ran that. So. Here would be an example where I have an ID, that's my consumer that is uh, processing the message. I have a tag that I can sort of like rock and say, oh, how many times did I call this request as opposed to looking at the uh, plain text message. And then I also have the module. In this case, it could be like controller equals plugin dot your controller name sort of thing. Um, one thing to consider about logging, I mentioned that you should use something like Graylog. Graylog would be self-hosted. I think there might be a platform where you can pay for that. but. Uh, services are more expensive generally than something that's self-hosted. So if you have the money to spend on that, great. If you don't, do realize that self-hosting is cheaper, but you also have to worry about stuff like retention periods and where logs go once they roll over, that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, you should probably ship all your logs and uh, filter them later. You don't really care whether or not you're uh, over-logging. You shouldn't, that shouldn't be a concern. Once you realize we don't need these logs, you can remove them from your application or you can filter them when they're coming in. As far as monitoring is concerned, uh, our site has to be globally available. We have users literally around the world. I think I saw someone uh, connect to us from Antarctica, and that was kind of weird. I didn't really know why there would be a CakePHP developer there. Um, but does your uh, website need to be available around the world? Might not. Maybe you're just uh, localized to a specific country, right? So you don't really have to worry about your uptime there. In our case, because we do have to worry about that, we use a service called Status Cake. Uh, the only reason why we use it is because it has cake in the name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we use a service called Status Cake to monitor our website, but there's plenty of other services such as Pingdom that can do this for you. We send server metrics via Diamond to a service called StatsD, and that sort of aggregates all of our metrics for us, and then uh, that stores them in a time series database called Graphite. Pretty nice. You can see like uh, server load time over the past five minutes, or how much disk space you have, or what that's trending towards. There's a lot of other uh, services that do this, so you can use something like Telegraph and Influx. Um, you can use something like Datadog, which is a paid service. Um, but really just anything will work. Um, and then finally, we use uh, Grafana for visualization. Graphite actually comes with Graphite Web, which is really nice for exploring metrics, but not really good for like creating dashboards. Um, something that we don't do is we don't have APM set up. So that's uh, performance monitoring stuff. That's like, uh, is uh, the MySQL query that I'm running 100 times a uh, second uh, really, really slow? And we don't really have that set up for any of our applications. It can be expensive. The major provider of this is New Relic. Um, I think Datadog has a solution. I think Blackfire IO is another one as well. But they're all, you know, you should have something available if you think that your application is that important. In our case, it's probably fine. We try to keep the SQL queries down and that sort of thing down. Um, and then finally, we also don't pay too much attention to site speed or uh, analytics, right? So is our website uh, going to be fast? Does Google think that it should be ranked higher? We don't pay attention too much to how many users we have at any given time just because it's fairly stable, right? Backups, uh, do them and verify them. You don't want to be caught with your pants down. Um, it's something that like uh, I have a lot of experience with. I've actually dropped a table in production, and that was probably the scariest uh, day of my life. I thought my boss was going to actually kill me. Um, so that's something that you should probably try to avoid. Um, in our case, our backups go to Backspace Cloud. That should be Rackspace Cloud. Uh, our, back our backups go to Rackspace Cloud. Uh, I manually clear them, so that way we don't incur too much, uh, um, too much in fees. I manually verify them once every month or two, uh, but that's something that we should probably do more often. Uh, if you have backups, you should verify them automatically, whether that be, oh, the backups aren't an empty file. The backups actually have SQL in them. The backups actually are increasing in size because we're accumulating more data. Right? That should be something that you do and automate. Uh, some things that we don't do for our backups, we don't have offsite backups. Uh, so if Rackspace goes down uh, or they delete our account or something like that, we're screwed. Um, that's something that I should work on. Our backups aren't encrypted. Um, thankfully, we don't store any personally identifiable information. But if you do, or even if you don't, it might be something that you want to look into. And then finally, we don't really have a disaster recovery plan at the moment. Um, if 
for whatever reason, there's a gigantic meteor that hits the data center we're located in, kind of screwed. Um, something that is, again, related to having offsite backups and that sort of thing. Cool. So I have about 15 seconds. Does anyone have any questions? All right, cool. Yep. Sweet. Any other questions? Great. Thanks.